morning, Bethel. My name's Pastor Nathan. This morning, uh, as most of you know, we're not having services in our regular locations due to the coronavirus. Uh, the week has been uncertain. Uh, we were uncertain of what we would do this week for services. We've been uncertain about what this virus looks like and the why. Some of us have been uncertain as to whether or not it's a big deal. For many of us, it seems like maybe it was overkill at first. And then after speaking with some leaders, we realized that it might be a bigger deal. And we, after spending time uh, conferring with local leaders and uh, and other um, uh, officials in the community, we felt that the most loving thing we could do was to have service online. And so if you're with us this morning, we're glad you're here. Know that if you've got something going on in your life, our hope here at Bethel is to be a place where real people can encounter the real Jesus and experience real change. And even though we're not having a meeting together this morning, we still want to be a place where that happens. If you've got something going on in your life this morning, if you make a decision this morning regarding this morning's message, we'd love to know about it. Feel free to message us through our Facebook page or even message me, Nathan, at Bethel.us or Jason at Bethel.us. Uh, if you've got something you'd like for us to pray for you about right now, we would love the opportunity uh, to do so. So this morning, uh, we had planned on a series uh, about forgiveness, but in light of everything that was going on and the uncertainty in our community, uh, through some conversations with my children and some prayer and some studying, uh, we entirely threw away what we were going to do today because we feel like uh, we have a great opportunity to speak hope into this situation. So this morning, the title of my message is From the Mouths of Babes and the Word of God. As, as this week unfolded, I'm sure that many of you experienced uncertainty, that there were uh, trips planned, like I had a trip planned to Florida, and it doesn't look like I'm going to go. I have respiratory issues, and it just doesn't look like the responsible decision. While I appear to be happy about that on the, inside, on the outside, the truth is I'm crying like a big baby on the inside. I really wanted to go. Maybe you experienced uncertainty in another area of your life this week. Maybe the workplace. Maybe you were trying to decide, am I going to have to figure out what to do with my kids next week? And maybe you had to figure out um, whether or not your work was going to be in play this week. Maybe all of this was uncertain. Maybe Really, you were just confident it wasn't a big, this wasn't a big deal. Maybe you were sure that it was, but you have experienced some uncertainty in your life. Most of us live really in a state of things that are far more uncertain than we usually feel. However, the question that I want to begin to ask this morning is, how can we be certain in times that are uncertain? You know, what we're living in right now feels very uncertain. Uh, but the reality of it is that oftentimes the things, the plans we make, the places we plan to go, the plans that we line out, they aren't as certain as we think. We think certainly about our retirement. We think certainly about our job and I'm going to get up tomorrow and go to work and I'm going to get up and this is going to be what my day looks like. And most days <clears throat> we get fooled by the fact that what we plan on happening happens. But what do we do when we're not sure what to do? What do we do when we aren't sure how things will work out? The truth is that while we're uncertain, God is still certain. And this week, as I walked through this process of trying to make a decision for our church and trying to decide what was best, and we tried to align ourselves to accomplish things, I experienced some uncertainty as a leader. And one of the things that happened to me over and over again is that my kids would say things to me to draw me out of my moment of uncertainty to the things that I've been certainly trying to teach them. And so I'm going to share a little bit of that this morning, and I'm going to a little bit share with you how during the course of this week, as I began to read and as I began to study and I began to pray, how God spoke into me how we can be certain despite the uncertainty. There are six truths that we can remember during times of uncertainty. This morning, we're going to talk through those, and we're going to 
try to internalize those. And then as we go back out into a world that is uncertain, we're going to try to hold firm to the certainty of God. Six ways that we can remember, the six things we can remember in the midst of uncertainty. Number one, the future is always uncertain. And I don't know about you, but I like when things go as planned. Um, I like when I can have a ritual and a way that I carry things out and it just happens. I like when, uh, when, my, when all the situations pan out, when the plan comes together. I like to believe oftentimes that I'm in control of things that are actually pretty uncertain. I like to believe that when it comes to my days that I have more control of them than I often do. And honestly, point one that I think we can all take in this week of uncertainty is that when it comes to our earthly future, it's uncertain. The truth is that before we heard about the coronavirus, before you heard that you needed to have a test run, before you, uh, your spouse told you there were issues in your marriage, the truth is things were already uncertain, but oftentimes we are in denial of it. Scripture tells us that life is fragile, that it's like a vapor or a mist, that it's fragile. James chapter 4, James, the brother of Jesus, is writing to the early, early Christians. And one of the reasons that I love James is that most of what he's teaching is really practical stuff. I don't know about you, but philosophy is a great thing. But on weeks like this, I need practical advice about how to deal with uncertainty. James gives some practical advice. James says to the people, the early Christians in a world uh, where Jesus has risen from the dead and they've been acting as Christians for just a short time and, and they begin to start to lose track a little of Jesus. And they, it's been a while and times are uncertain. The culture is in turmoil. And James is, he tells them this. He says, now listen, you who say today or tomorrow, you see, Jesus had said that he was coming back, and a great many of them thought that meant quickly. And so after a while, after Jesus, it was a while after the resurrection of Jesus, and Jesus had not yet returned, he had not yet come back, he'd give them a commission to go be the church, and many of them were sliding back into a mindset of the old way of thinking, that they were living for an old way or an old kingdom. But Jesus tells them this, he says, listen, or James, the brother of Jesus, says, listen, you who say today or tomorrow we will go to this city or that city and spend a year there and carry on business and make money. Jesus is saying, hey, all of you who make all of these plans certainly, why do you not even know why? You do not even know what will happen tomorrow. You see, in times of uncertainty, the fragility of our life becomes far more obvious even though this life is fragile he says you're a mist that appears for a little while and vanishes meaning that while you may be certain about how life will go while you may think that you can be certain of things where you can be certain of the stock market and you can be certain of your health and you can be certain of all these things. The truth of you and I is that in the scope of human history, we are just a blip in, in history. And what he's saying is that you can live for something that is temporary or you can choose to live that's for something permanent. It is my hope during this time of uncertainty, Bethel, that we will be a people who live in the certainty of God. And so in, in, in our temptation to constantly ease back into what we're certain of and what we're sure of, as much as we hate these uh, events like the, the COVID-19, as much as we hate uh, the reality of those things, the reality is they just remind us of a fragility that already existed, that this life is temporary. And while we're here, we have a purpose to live for. And so let's not draw back in to an old way or a certain way of thinking about things that will be certain but remind Jesus or James is reminding people to keep focus 
on that which is certain, and that is Jesus. He goes on to say, instead, you should say, if it is the Lord's will, we will live and do this or that. So often, I'm tempted to live my life for my will, for what I want, for how I hope things go. And the reality is, events like this in our history, moments like this in our time, the moment in which there's uncertainty about our health or uncertainty about a test or uncertainty in our job or uncertainty in the economy, they're great moments to be reminded of the certainty of God. Point two, people matter to God. In John chapter 3, verse 16, one of the most well-known passages in all of Scripture, um, John basically says this. He says, God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son that whoever believes in him will not perish and have everlasting life. The truth is, in these moments, we often begin to question God. What is going on? Just a little earlier, I, I told my son, I've never seen anything like this before. They're canceling things left and right. I mean, after all, March Madness is certain. But certainly they'll finish March Madness. Certainly there will not be an asterisk under every major sporting event in 2020. Sure, surely uh, there will not be weeks and weeks, but we are not sure of these things. But we can be sure of Jesus. And we can be sure that while we're in the midst of uncertainty, that when God looked upon humanity, that his decision, that his choice, that his, every bit of his character was one that chose love toward us. So that while our lives are still uncertain, uncertain, we are loved. As we walk through uncertain seasons, <clears throat> where temporary pain and struggle is a possibility, where inconvenience is a possibility, it's key to remember the love of God for people. And while that's good for us, and for those of you who follow Jesus, you're like, yeah, I know, I know God loves me, but here's the deal. He loves other people too. He loves the people who aren't following Jesus. He loves the people who aren't put together and aren't lined out and don't have it together. And my friends, we live in a culture that it is not only people who follow Jesus that feel uncertainty, it's every single human but we've been giving something certain in Jesus. Scripture goes on to say in, John, in James chapter 5, verse 10 and 11, it says, brothers and sisters, as an example, meaning you and I have the ability, because people matter, we have the ability to be an example. Earlier this week, I was pretty frustrated at the inconvenience of missing out on a mental health trip that I was going to go on. I was pretty frustrated at the fact that we could be trying to figure out what to do with our children uh, the next couple weeks while we work. Um, as I picked up my son from school, he was talking about what he had heard at school about the coronavirus. And there are these moments as a parent where sometimes the kid teaches you something, where sometimes the kid... Uh, actually kind of becomes the parent for a minute. And so I was sulking and irritated and frustrated and feeling extremely inconvenienced at this situation. I had a meeting to get home to, and my son said, Dad, it would be okay if I got sick and some of the other people at my school didn't. And I said, what? What are you talking about? I was irked. I was like, oh, that's the most ridiculous thing that I've ever heard, that you would be okay with getting sick, that you would be okay with getting this virus that we don't know much about or whatever. And I, I almost snapped back, uh, what are you talking about? But as a parent of a teenager, I've learned that you, uh, you don't always snap back your first thought. If you want to stay in the game with your teenager, sometimes you wait a minute and listen. And I uh, thought, and you ask questions rather than give commands. And so I was like, hey, buddy, what do you mean by that? And he's like, well, dad, I mean, I know Jesus. And if I die, I'll go to heaven. 
But there are people that I know that don't know Jesus. And it seared my heart because here I was thinking about how I keep all my plans lined out, how I keep all my stuff together, about how I get to go on my trip and how we just be able to keep our schedule right and our schedule lined out at church. And I mean, God forbid I be disrupted in my life. And my son had taken root of a truth that I've been trying to teach him for years, a truth that we've tried to put into his heart and see deep in his heart that other people matter. And so as we made our decision, it came down to me deciding that I've got to ask, what's the best thing to do for the people God loves? As we walk through this season together, let's not be the people on Facebook who say, I can't get sick, doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. How selfish is it to say, I'd be fine, it's not a big deal. How selfish is it while there is a part of our culture who have major respiratory issues and their life is valuable their existence is valuable their purpose is important to God so we need to be good neighbors during this time and recognize that the people who live next door to us are fine we need to not buy 2,000 rolls of freaking toilet paper we need to look for the needs of our neighbors because people matter to God and we're given a chance to be an example an example of patience in the face of suffering or adversity or patience in rough situations or patience in inconvenience and uncertainty we we have been given an opportunity because we've experienced God's love we've been given the ability to show God's love by living out godly behaviors and godly mentality. It says, brothers and sisters, as an example of patience in the face of suffering, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. He's, he's like, remember these guys who came before who entrusted God even while rough things happened to them. And he says, as you know, we count bless those who have persevered. We now, the people who persevered before us, the people who went through rough seasons, we now look up to them. We now consider them blessed. You've heard of Job's perseverance. Job was a biblical character who lost nearly everything he had. And yet, over time, God restored him. He went through a period of time questioning God, wrestling with God. And yet here, many, many years later, in the book of James, James is pointing back to Job, who went through a time of uncertainty, who went through a time of what felt like God's silence, who wondered and questioned, and James is reminding us to be an example like Job. He says, the Lord, and then he reminds us that the Lord is full of compassion and mercy. Number three, prayer is powerful. During a time of uncertainty, often it's, it's our temptation then to pray to God, to ask God questions we don't typically ask. Rather than feeling guilty for when we don't, I think it is a great thing that we be praying to God. I also think that right now, one of the most powerful ways we can be the church in the culture, that we can be uh, not just be a church that meets or even a church that has a video, is to be a people who go to God. That we can be reminded of this truth that we have an audience with God, that we have the ability to go to God. And, and Scripture says this, is anyone among you in trouble? Or is anyone among you uncertain? Let them pray that it's an appropriate response for uncertainty to say, what do we do here? You know, I don't know about you, but I tend to, when I'm making big decisions in life, I tend to try to find experts. Um, when I got ready to buy a house, any dude in this church who had any idea of what to look for for a house, they walked through the house with me. Guy would go in there and sneak in around the realtor. I would like, we would get in there and look at every little thing of the house. And God would say, I don't know about this or I don't know about that. When I go to buy a vehicle, I always find the good mechanic. I always call my dad, who, who's a good mechanic. I always try to find the person who knows what they're doing and, and get them to take a look. So oftentimes we listen so much to all the experts, but we neglect to talk to God. 
What is the right thing to do? In time of uncertainty, it's a very appropriate thing for us to ask. What's the most loving thing to do? What's the most godly thing to do in this situation? While many of us are powerless over some of the uncertainty in our culture today, we're certainly not powerless to go to God. Scripture goes on to say, let him pray. Is anyone happy? Let him sing songs of praise. Is anyone among you sick? Call upon the elders of the church to pray over them and anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. To trust God to be able to move on behalf of the people that he loves. And the prayer offered in faith will make a sick person well. The Lord will raise them up. If they have sinned, they will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. You want to know how to be helpful right now? Pray. Be praying for people. Be praying for your neighbors. Listen to common sense. Number four, peace is possible. A couple nights ago, I, I got ready to go to bed, and it was one of those nights where Governor Holcomb was sending out uh, messages, and the Department of Health was updating their site every 20 minutes, and uh, staff was messaging me uh, about, like, what are we going to do? And volunteers were, people who don't normally message me were reaching out, like, what are we going to do? What's our decision? And uh, honestly, I was tired. And I was getting frustrated at, like, I've thought about this, thought about this, thought about this, to the spot as to where my mind was just rolling in circles. And, and I finally got to the place where, in a conversation with one of my staff members, where I was like, hey, the best thing I can do right now is to go to bed, to think about this in the morning. And you know what? I said a prayer, and I went to bed. You know why? Because I was reminded that God is still in control. Be reminded that God is still in control. You can be in peace all the while you're experiencing uncertainty. In Philippians chapter 4, verse 4 through 9, Paul says something that seems uh, pretty interesting. He says, rejoice. But the funny thing is, Paul was in prison. Every part of Paul's life in this particular passage is uncertain. There's a government over the prison that could kill him. There are people after him. Paul's already nearly been killed. Everything's uncertain. Paul had a calling from God. And yet he was stuck within the walls of the prison and it didn't look like he could carry out. And while he's writing this letter that we still talk about today, Paul's, Paul's imprisoned and whether or not he will ever get out is up in the air. It's uncertain. And from his uncertain place, Paul tells us this. He says, rejoice in, in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. My youngest son, who's nine, you have to understand he loves NBA basketball. I mean, he walks down the stairs every morning and the first thing he does is give me the update that I watched on Sports Center already. Dad, LeBron scored 23, had 10, 10 assists and five rebounds. Dad, Anthony Davis did this. He's informing me. He loves basketball. Like, I can ask him at any point who's playing tonight and he can name all three to five games. He loves it. He lives for it. When he can't watch it, he goes and plays it. When, when he can't play it or watch it, he wants to watch somebody else play it on the TV. He loves basketball. And this week, like all the things he's been looking forward to in basketball are coming up. NCAA tournament, NBA finals, and they all got canceled. And he was bummed. And each time one of them would come up, he would come tell me, Dad, Kansas isn't playing in the tournament. Dad, Kentucky, SEC tournament's not going to happen. So Kentucky doesn't get to prove that they're the best team in the country and win the title. By the way, go Cats. And then and he, he comes to me and he, he's telling me all this. And then he says, Dad, I shouldn't be whining about this. And I'm like, why, buddy? Now, He's been talking for a couple minutes, okay? So 
all I caught on to at the end was I shouldn't be whining about this. Just know this. I was sitting there in the chair in full whine mode. I was whining constantly in my head. And here's my nine-year-old, my 10-year-old son actually saying, I shouldn't be whining. And I'm like, why? He goes, well, because we got each other, dad. Because we'll get more family time together if all this stuff doesn't happen. Instantly, the conviction of God on my heart was here I am whining about a vacation I've been on numerous times. And I have a son who's excited to spend time with me. We can always find things to be grateful for. You got up this morning. You may be sitting somewhere with somebody. You may be alone. But you can be grateful for the fact that there's a church who loves you. That there's, that there's a God who loves you. Gratitude will go a long way when you're going through a time of uncertainty. Finding the things that you are certain about and leaning into those things. In Philippians chapter 4 goes on to say, let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God. Be in prayer. And the peace of God, the peace of God will transcend all understanding. Will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. You can have peace. He goes on to say, finally, brothers, and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Sure, listen to the news. Know the information. Listen, listen, listen to your board of health. They, they care about your well-being. They're concerned that you're well. Listen to that stuff. But don't let your focus be on what is uncertain. Let your focus be on the certainty of God's goodness and God's love for you and know that there is peace found in him. That whatever you're experiencing, maybe you don't care about the coronavirus, maybe you don't think it's a big deal, but whatever uncertainty you have in life, will that child turn around? Can my marriage be saved? Will we make it financially? Will my business be ruined? Maybe all that uncertainty, maybe it's in that that we lean in and begin to see what we do have Maybe if we begin to focus on what is good, whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice, Paul said, and the God of peace will be with you. And when Paul said that from the prison, when he said, whatever you've seen from me, the reality is that today, over 2,000 years later, the witness of what Paul did in that prison and his trust in God is directly in front of you on slides in the middle of your uncertain moment. Let the way we live in uncertainty remind others of the certainty of God. Number five, God is good. Not because we're good, not because we perform well, not because everything's together and under control. God's good because it's his character. It's who he is. See, in the midst of uncertainty, we can begin to twist our belief about who God is. We can begin to talk about whether or not God really knows what he's doing, really or whether or not God uh, is in control, whether or not, but the reality is the character of God is good. Historically, throughout history, God has been remarkable at keeping his promises for his followers. He's been remarkable about living up to the promises that he's given us. Every good and perfect gift from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights who does not change like shifting shadows. You can know that when you're uncertain, it doesn't mean that God is. You can know that while everything around you may seem in chaos, God is not surprised. God is not taken by surprise when, life, when your life doesn't go as planned. You can know that he is good. And that while things are uncertain, God is, there is, there is one story after another. There are story after story after story in Scripture 
of times that seemed uncertain, times when the nation of Israel, when God's people seemed weak, times in which it looked like Jesus was dead for three days. It looked so uncertain and so unsure. And yet his son rose from the dead. He rose from the dead. You can know that God is good and his goodness does not change in our circumstances. It's who he is. Number six, there's hope. The best is yet to come. Regardless of what you're worried about, what you're afraid might ruin you or what might uh, mess up your life or how your plans might be thwarted. Let me remind you this morning that there's always hope in Jesus. That 2,000 years ago, after an evil empire and religious people put him to death, that three days later when they looked for his body, it wasn't there because he had risen from the dead what looked to be hopeless burst out hope that uncertain situations often lead to an opportunity for god to be revealed may we not forget may we not forget that we have an opportunity to experience god in a new and unique way as we walk through days of uncertainty that we can be more certain of who he is. May we be reminded that our hope is not in a retirement account, that our hope is not in an economy that's fragile, that our hope is not in a heart that can break down, that our hope is not in whether or not we get a virus, that our hope is in Jesus, that our hope is in one who defeated sin and death once and for all time, that this is just temporary, but that we live for something permanent in the promise of God. May we have hope because the best is yet to come. That if you have chosen to follow Jesus, the best is yet to come for you. That when you die, when you pass from this earth, and we all will, that's not the end of the story. There's hope in Jesus. If you put your trust in him, you can be assured that your best is yet to come. I often wonder how people can be incredibly generous, incredibly loving, self-sacrificing about the people who serve passionately, serve other people and never get tired of it, about the people who never seem to pout. What is it about those people? What is that? Where does that come from? I'll tell you, I believe that great neighbors, that great Christ followers, come from a power, the power of God when, when, when God instills upon our heart that this isn't forever, but that he has great things in store for us in our future. And we don't live for the hope of this world, but we live for the hope of heaven. And because we live for the hope of heaven, we can be great neighbors now. We can be great citizens now. We can live at peace. Listen, if you're watching this morning, and you've never placed your trust in Jesus Christ, I would encourage you this morning to lean in and to begin to ask some questions. Maybe you are uncertain. Is this Jesus thing for real? Maybe you're uncertain. Is there really any purpose to life? Maybe you're uncertain. Can I really be redeemed from where I've been? Maybe you've been taught not to ask God those questions. But I think now's a perfect time. And you can know this. You don't have to have all the answers and all the understanding to begin to follow Jesus. You don't have to ascribe to a perfect way of thinking in order to follow Jesus. As a matter of fact, Jesus called men who thought nothing like him to follow him. And he told them, come and follow me and I will make you fishers of men. And if you want to do that this morning, all you, you just, all you need to do is in your heart is to receive him as your Lord and Savior. You know, Jesus, maybe you're here today and you're like, I'm nothing like the religious people that I know. And that whole Jesus thing, I don't know if I could be a part of that because my life is not together. You know, Jesus loved people who were nothing like Jesus and people who were nothing like Jesus, like Jesus and when their life encountered Jesus, it was forever changed. That's your choice this morning. Bethel, the best is yet to come. Hey, thanks for joining us today. Are you ready to take your next step? 
If you are, we would love to help you do that. You can send us an email to hello at Bethel.us or you can message us right here on Facebook. Hey, have you downloaded the Bethel app? If you haven't, today would be a great day to do that. You can search Bethel Putco in your app store and download the Bethel app today. There you can view sermons, you can watch the announcements, you can check out the sermon notes, lots of other resources are there available, and you can also give. So take a moment and download the Bethel app today. Hey, Easter is right around the corner. We would love to have you come and spend Easter at Bethel. Sunday, April 12th, we will have two services, 9 a.m. and 10.30 a.m., both at Deer Meadow Primary School in Greencastle. Hope is alive. Come check out Easter at Bethel. Hey, thanks again for joining us. We hope you have a great week and know that you are loved.